commence our next discussion on unlocking urban land potential, I would like to invite Mr. Nayana Marvel Mother, President, Property Group, John Keels Holdings, to deliver the presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Privileged to be here. Uh, just to get people a little uh, going, can I just take a poll, please? How many of you live within Colombo municipal limits? OK. Must be a very affluent audience. How many of you live in your own house? And how many live in an apartment? How, OK, how many live in an apartment? Very, very few. OK. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why, actually, I asked that question of who lives in Colombo. Uh, I'll go through the slides in a little bit as soon as they, they get it together. Uh, but basically, what you have in Colombo uh, is a city where we have people who are very rich and people who are very poor. Uh, and the middle class basically lives outside of Colombo, by and large. Okay? Uh, and just like in other sectors, they talk about the missing middle. Uh, in housing uh, and in urban development, the middle is completely missing. And I think the amount of literature and the amount of study in what is happening to the middle in urban development is also completely missing. Right? So uh, my hope in this conversation is to, I, I think, really just start a little conversation about that, uh, about uh, really considering what's happening with the middle class, because the, the conversion of urban development is really about focusing on this middle class. OK, so as I said before, unlocking urban development uh, is, is one of those big pieces of things that we will have to do over the next few years. I am not advocating, to be very clear, that you can do this immediately. Uh, I realize full well that what we have to do right now is just get out of the gutter uh, in terms of the economy. But we do have to look longer term in terms of how we want to deal with our cities and really set that trajectory going. So there's four key characteristics of, of our urban, urban development, right? We have this unchecked sprawl, you know, settlement that's spreading everywhere. We've got extremely fragmented land holdings. We've got very, very low density, widely dispersed housing. And we have, as I mentioned before, a gentrifying city. So you have rich and poor, and the middle class are kind of out. And more and more, the middle class are moving out. And that is the pattern that we see uh, with our cities. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an image of a study done by the World Bank. This is satellite night light data taken over the last 35 years. What you see in white is development that's been there over the last 35 years, uh, 35 uh, or so. The yellow is uh, 10 years after that. The red is what's happened really in the last 15 years. And you can see that it's unmistakable that we have a settlement that is sprawling and sprawling and sprawling. It also incidentally shows you where people actually live. Right? So regardless of what you see in plans and master plans and uh, national, physical planning, national physical plans, this really shows you where people are. And it's very, very clear. Most of us live in the western province, going down the southern belt. It's a, a big agglomeration in, uh, in Jaffna. And the, Can and the Colombo one is really just spreading towards Candy. That's really what is happening. And if you look at the census data over periods of time, again, you see this progression. It just kind of, it just kind of spreads like a cancer. Right? So we have urban development, or what we call urban development, spreading like a cancer, eating up, uh, eating up the country. Basically, that's what we have. Uh, this shows, again, the differences in population, or the growth rates in population, over, a period, uh, over the last two census periods. Uh, the DSD data, we have it. Uh, Fairly recently, we don't have Gram and Iladari devil data for the most recent census yet, but the trend is in unmistakable. You have migration coming out of the city, right? So what you see in blue is population that is negative. Uh, what you see in the reds are populations that are uh, going uh, much more positive, right? There'll be a small reversion, I think, between 11 uh, and 2020, as you can see in the map on the left, uh, because there are some high density developments happening in the city, but by and large, the trend. Uh, is, is something else. Same thing on industry. We talked, we will talk, I'm sure, in the next session about industrial parks, but we scatter industry everywhere. 
there is really no agglomeration that we can talk of. Uh, I'm not going to talk about industry, but this is also a major, major problem. I was really trying to uh, figure out, OK, well, is there a pattern here? And if you squint really hard, you'll see the roads. That's really the only pattern. OK, so that's a problem that we are not really dealing with uh, with that uh, very, very well. And it's interspersed with this sprawling residential. Uh, now, this is kind of an interesting slide. Uh, it shows where we are in multifamily housing as a percentage of the total amount of housing relative to other parts of the world. We're at about 10% 10, 10 condominiumized housing, 90% single family residential. That's why I said I think this room is not representative actually, of, of, of Colombo. Uh, the, the image on the right is also very revealing. Uh, what you see in green is one to two story construction. Very, very low density, and it's spreading, uh, spreading like hell, really. Uh, and we're an outlier in the region, right? If you look at any other city in the region, multifamily housing is at least 50%. And it's just, it's, it's an anomaly that we are at 10% in our capital city. It's, it's really quite strange. Well, it's not really strange, it's because we've had bad policy for years and years and years. That's what it is. Uh, and this is one of those policies that we encourage and we love this land subdivision, right? Uh, and you go anywhere in the city or anywhere in the Western, anywhere in the country for that matter, you'll see tons of advertisements for land subdivision. So we basically are carving up the Western province and most of our urban areas into 10 purchase or so a plot. Uh, and then when it comes to trying to do efficient uh, scale development, you can't find the land. Not in the private domain. It's all carved up. And I can say that with some authority because I've been hunting for this land for the last five years. You just can't find it. So it's a major, major problem, fragmentation. And this is what it looks like, right? I mean, you can, you can take an aerial photo of every, any, any city in Sri Lanka, and this is what it's like. It's like a carpet. Right? So this is Colombo looking north, south, uh, east. And these are other cities. You have Kandy, you have Kurunagala. You take anywhere. It's like a rash. You have to deal with it. You have to have to deal with it. OK. So, so the bottom line with, with this kind of low density, fragmented, kind of 10 perch, 6 perch housing is it's a very, very inefficient way to use a very, very finite resource in this country. Right? Uh, you have to look at changing this dynamic and getting into a different model so that you can do it more densely and, and really create better quality of life. It's really also an extremely inefficient a uh, way to develop and service. You can't make public utilities efficient if you've just got a carpet that's going for tens and tens of uh, tens and 20, 30, 40 miles, which is just two story. You just can't make it work, right? So you have to have to change this. There's no other choice. Now, the fundamental problem, one of the fundamental problems is, okay, so we live all over the place. But we still, if you, I'm just going to focus on the Western province for a second, we still have to come into the city. Why? All of our greatest schools, our jobs, uh, most of the entertainment, uh, most of the, the offices, everything is in the city. Right? So you have this massive movement in and out of the city. And uh, the vast majority of you do the same thing, probably. Right? So we have two million trips crossing Colombo every day. OK, this is pre-pandemic. And as soon as we get fuel, I'm sure we'll be back to it. OK? Uh, so that's about 600,000 vehicles a day coming into Colombo. Okay? And that's kind of insane, really, when you think about it. So then the question is, OK, how do you bring this number of people? So let's just take the premise that, OK, it's fine. We have to live outside but let's come in, and how do we deal with this? Then you need to really look at how do you bring people in. And if you look historically how we have invested in public transportation versus private transportation, it's, it's a bit sad. Okay, I mean, this, it's hard to find the data because we keep amalgamating ministries with kind of uh, crazy things. But if you just look at, say, 2020 uh, and uh, 2021, uh, you can see it's like, you know, five, six, seven times. Uh, the investment in roads versus public transportation. So we have chosen low-density housing, sprawling. 
we have chosen extremely inefficient single car modes of transport to come into the centers that we have created. Uh, so we, this, is, uh, this is a fundamental problem. So here's, here's the steps on that. Uh, again, from pre-pandemic, pre we have about, uh, don't, this screen is not working. Uh, we have about, about roughly half of the passengers coming in come in uh, private transport. They take up like 87% of road space. Right? 87% of road space. Uh, it doesn't seem quite fair. Uh, it's ridiculous. We have to change it. We have to change it. So we buy, we love buying cars, right? Every youngster in this uh, place probably wants to first buy a cell phone and then buy a car. Right? We love cars. But we keep going slower and slower and slower every, every year. Okay? Doesn't make any sense. So we have to reset. And we have a massive productivity loss because of this. This, again, was taken pre-pandemic. Pre Travel times at peak time from Google, from Google Maps. How long it takes to come into Colombo, right? So you're talking, on average, uh, three hours a day, back and forth, right? Uh, just think about how much time that is. Just stop and think about that. Three hours every day. That's about four, you know, three to four hour days a month that you are actually sitting in a car. Imagine if you do that for like 40 years of your life. That's like you sat four years in your car. <laughs> right? But this is what we do. And we rob children. Like by the time you, 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 you're a child, you go to school, you, by the time you get out of school, you spent a year in your car. Actually, a year of your childhood sitting in a car. It just is not right. Okay, so, so this low density sprawl and private transport is toxic. It is disastrous for Sri Lanka and it has changed, absolutely has to change. Okay, so I'm not gonna read all these things, but you, I think we talked about it a little, uh, but the, the list of impacts really just goes on and on and on. Okay, now the interesting thing about this problem is you can't solve one without solving the other. You have to solve land use, but you can't solve land use without fixing transport. They're so inextricably linked. So you have to solve both together. That's the only way that you can actually solve this problem. So as Einstein says, the world we have created is a product of our thinking. 30, 40 years, of ridiculous urban policy that has to change. And if we change our thinking, I think we stand a chance, okay? So there's millions of things that we will need to do probably, but I just want to focus you on four, which I think at a high level are the fundamental shifts, the fundamental resets that we must do. And we have an opportunity to do it, uh, and we must do it in the next few years. Otherwise, this is going to be a massive drain uh, on our economy. Four things. Transition to mass transit. Stimulate transit-oriented development. Densify housing. And establish a single window for state land transactions. I'll explain this uh, a little bit uh, uh, in a second. But before that, let me just, just, because it's kind of alien to most people, I'll do a very, very simple uh, case study uh, just to illustrate what we mean here. This is Candy, my hometown. Uh, and it's the same pattern, okay? You have the, the population differences uh, between uh, the last two census periods. Blue city is emptying out, the core city is emptying out, everybody's going to the burbs. Same thing, and you see this in every city in, in, in Sri Lanka, and you see this agglomeration in the red dots. Uh, that's where the buildings are. It's a little constrained in Kandy because of the topography, but the pattern is exactly the same. It's sprawling everywhere. And, you know, Candy is interesting, there's three corridors coming in, uh, and all these three corridors uh, are really quite overburdened. One coming from Katugastata, uh, one coming uh, from Piradenia, and the other one coming from the Kundasale around the lake. So all of these, if anybody has been to Candy, uh, well, maybe not so recently, but before the pandemic, you'd realize why we have the worst air quality in the country. Okay? Uh, we have 55,000 vehicles coming into this place a day. It's a small city, 
right? And 30,000 of those are private cars. So, you know, it goes without saying. It's the same, same problem uh, that, that you have this kind of sprawl and, and, and congestion. But here's the, really, here's the really cool thing about Candy. The red line is the rail trace. Every single school in Candy, all the hospitals in Candy, most of the offices in Candy, right? Most of the social infrastructure in Candy, all the key government offices in Candy are within walking distance from the train line. Okay? And it's been that way for like 50 years, right? But we have this line which is grotesquely unutilized. This is the Candy Matale line. Okay? So what can you do if you really do look at modernizing this train? It's a, it's a very simple thing to do because the track is always there. It's just that there are no trains. I mean, I don't think you need an, even need to have fancy trains. You just need to have a train running on it. Like I was a kid, we used to walk along the rail line because it was much faster than kind of walking on the road. <laughs> okay? So if you do this, this is, uh, this is some mapping of the, of the land between uh, Katugastota going into Kandy, and you'll see large, uh, large swathes of land which, okay, maybe are not yet fragmented too badly, and you can deal with it, and you can use that as a stimulus to change. And one of the areas in, in the bottom here is an area called Mahayav. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, which is where this zone where you have tons and tons of car sales. So it's basically a gigantic parking lot. Okay, that's what it is. It's actually literally a gigantic parking lot. But what if you go in here and change the game? Change the zoning. Allow high rises. Eliminate some of the parking requirements. Uh, and allow, you know, if you have this modernized, modernized uh, railway line and you allow, say, 10, 15 story development, you can easily house 25, 30,000 people in Mahaya actually, and not add one car to the traffic, okay? Uh, so, the, you know, this whole idea of, uh, of transit-oriented development is really trying to get density close to modes of transport that can move high volumes of people, okay? And then you need to figure out how do you simulate that. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Again, just a very, a very quick sketch. Uh, of some stuff we were planning some years ago about what happens if we do, just for example, uh, do, uh, do Mahayava. Now, one of those things that I, I forgot to mention is how do you make sure these guys actually do this? You've got to stop them from breaking this into 10 perches or less. Okay? You've got to block that, and you've got to mandate that you know, to get these rights to develop at density at scale where you really can make some money uh, and make it really efficient, you've got to have large parcels, and you've got to disincentivize and regulate that so that that parceling up really just has to stop. Similarly, there's tons of TOD, transit-oriented development opportunities, wrong along the sadly canceled Colombo Light Rail Trace. There's 50 acres of state land around Fort Railway Station. Okay. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got Valikada Prison, we've got land in Rajagiriya, we've got land in Batramulla, okay? Gobs and gobs of land that really would unleash value in a phenomenal way if you really did this in a structured, systematic way. But to make it work, you have to have the transit also. These two go hand in glove, okay? These two go hand in glove. The same thing, is true of the Kalani Valley rail line. This is the plotting of the Kalani Valley rail line. Uh, and if you look a little closer, you see the station points in yellow dots. If you look a little closer, uh, the pink ring is 500 meters from the station. The blue ring is 1,000 meters from the station. If you have regular good service, easily people will walk 500 meters to get to a train station. Uh, Dimanta and I were talking, the other panelist, and uh, he was saying the research now suggests it's actually 800 meters. So that, you know, you, you have uh, railway stations along the Kalani Valley line, which are, you know, between one and one and a half uh, kilometers apart. So basically, you're creating a zone along the entire Kalani Kal Kal Valley line, basically, that, uh, that can basically be a pedestrian, mostly pedestrian, very, very low traffic uh, zone that feeds into mass transit. So this is, again, uh, something that 
could have, maybe still can be done. So four resets. Reset number one is a transition to mass transit. We have to make this happen. Okay? It is the absolutely most critical fundamental step. It is the backbone of this entire system. Okay? Uh, you have to do it. So the, the ways to do it, though, is not to just introduce one line. You have to look at this as a system. You know, look at it like your blood circulation system. Right? You've got to have rail linking high-density corridors that are existing. You've got to have rail that is going to uh, new rail that goes feeds uh, populations that are not covered by rail. So the Kalani Valley is an existing rail. The, the LRT is a new rail line because that corridor is the most heavily trafficked, the, the highest traffic is along the 3,000 for a corridor. That is why the LRT uh, made sense. But you also have to deal with bus. And bus, uh, you know, there's a raging debate on this, but in principle, you know, while you have some bus routes which will probably still have to come into Colombo, by and large, bus should feed into rail, right? So it's like your capillaries reading into your big arteries or your, your big veins. You know, you just got to, it's a, it's a, it's, so you have to look at this as a system and you've got to regulate this as a system, right? And you have to disincentivize private transport. And one way to do this, which is done in cities like London and Singapore, is to have congestion pricing. You pay if you enter the city with these gantries uh, at all to rent to the city with a car. And it's incredibly successful. But you have to do that while providing an alternative to people. Okay, it's a bit politically unpopular. Uh, I see our legislators worried about it, but I don't think, I don't think uh, it's impossible, actually. Because if you've got a good alternative, you, have to, you can actually pull it off. Okay. Reset number two. Stimulate how transit-oriented development. Okay. Uh, basically, as I mentioned before, you're talking about zoning changes, right? Change the land use zones, permit high density, and, and you have to eliminate this mandatory parking requirement. Our regulations are distorted uh, as uh, now, I, you know, I look at lots of feasibilities for new projects, and, uh, you know, the, the regulation that's been recently issued is, is one parking spot for every apartment unit in housing, and then one for every 10 as visitor parking, okay? Uh, so that really ends up being about 25% of your build, okay? So think about cost and think about how much, a thousand square foot apartment, 350 square foot or so to, to park and turn a car. It doesn't make sense. If you do a feasibility for an office development, which I've done recently, uh, about 30% of your building is parking, maybe a little bit more. So you, you kill it, uh, but you have to take that requirement out uh, and, and plug it in to mass transit. And that's what transit-oriented uh, development is, is all about. Uh, the other thing is to prevent this fragmentation. And again, you have to do this through regulation. You can't shock people into saying, look, merge all the lands, but you've got to create incentives for people to amalgamate to extract value. Okay. Uh, so so you, you basically allow for development larger plot sizes, which forces, you know, three, four people to get together and amalgamate those plots. So uh, you can commercially develop these more efficiently and as a result, bring costs down. But one of the more important things that we have to do, because this fragmentation exists, is the government needs to strategically intervene and release some assets for transit-oriented development to lead the way, because the government still has unfragmented land, like the 50 acres around uh, Fort, and I mean the section from Nelung Kuluna all the way to Lake House, that entire stretch is government land, that entire stretch. Okay, that's about as long as the Singapore River uh, development that you see in Singapore. Uh, so uh, I think really looking at this and saying, look, which lands do we develop? Which transit lines do we invest in first, and how do you develop the lands in tandem? The other thing that we can and should think about is how we deal with what we call air rights, the space above stations, above transit. A city, the city of Boston is mostly built on air rights. 
most of the city of Boston sits on top of rail infrastructure, rail, uh, metro, and highway infrastructure. Okay? So we have to seriously look at air rights, because when you look at air rights, basically we're talking build on top of stations. There's nothing preventing us except our parking regulation, because you don't need parking if you build on top of, say, Fort Railway Station or Candy Railway Station. So we have to look at that very, very seriously. Okay. Preset number three, densify housing. Okay. You have to uh, look at land, land market interventions and, and zoning, as I talked about before. And uh, you know, some of it is in transit-oriented, but even in other areas, we do really seriously need to look at, uh, at densification. But we have to also reduce the cost of multifamily housing. Right now, it's painful. Uh, to develop multifamily housing. One, because of all the reasons of bad governance and regulations and rent seeking and all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on. Uh, but, you know, a couple of other things that are just kind of easy to kind of swap in a way. One is this parking regulation that I talked about. It's my pet peeve. Uh, I tell my consultants who work on projects that if you know anybody that has a PhD in how to drive, design the most efficient parking lot in the world, that's the guy you need in Sri Lanka to make a project economically viable with the new regulations. You also have to eliminate protectionism in construction materials, uh, uh, construction, even, uh, construction and materials. You have to eliminate it. You can buy, you know, we pay more in Sri Lanka for tiles, cement, uh, aluminum, uh, and stuff like this than we do in the world market, right? And that gets passed on to the, per, at the end of the day, it gets passed on to the consumer, right? Uh, so, so this is a major, major problem, and that gets sub, supplemented by all these para-tariffs, which make, again, stuff really, really expensive. And you, you import a steel bar. Uh, I don't know if you can even do it anymore, to be honest. But by the time you get it to a site, it's about 100% more. Uh, and that cost gets passed on to consumers, which is why most people are priced out of the city. Okay, you have to look at uh, this, this uh, cost structure and help target a, in a targeted way uh, to bring middle income housing costs down. You also have to streamline the approvals process. I won't get into it. It's complicated, but, and that maybe is the hardest thing actually to do. Uh, but you also need to look a little bit at housing finance and enhance uh, housing finance access. Again, I know it's something that we can't do right now because we're kind of in a bit of a mess. But generally speaking, you can't go and get a mortgage unless you prove to the bank that you don't need the money. Uh, so that has to change. Uh, again, targeting uh, the middle, middle. And I said before, you have to release some state lands. The state lands must be re released, not just like come the highest bidder, take it. It's you've got to release it for a purpose. If you really think as a policy, you must have you know, 100,000 more middle-income housing units in the city, then let's release some land with that explicit purpose and let that be one of the evaluation criteria. And we've done this before, can be done. Uh, 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 but you have to release with purpose, not release just kind of like, here's a buffet, which one do you want? It's here's what we want to do, here's part of our larger plan, uh, and here's what we, what we can do to help that come in. And the last point is really kind of also really important. You have to target the middle class. Successive governments rush to rehouse the poor. Clean up the slums, put them in high rise. Everybody loves it. Why? Because you think it looks terrible. Right? But the reality is, in the city, that's probably some of the most efficient housing. I mean, these housing units are like, one perch, one and a half perches max, uh, whereas somebody sitting in a nice 20 perch block on a single family house could actually be having 20, right? So it, they're actually quite efficient. And there's a whole host of social uh, issues which I won't get into. So I think we have to resist this urge of, oh, we need to densify, let's please just bulldoze all these poor people into these high rises and be done with it. That's really not what you need to do. You need to look at the middle class and you need to address the middle class problem. You have to do that. That's what you have to do. I'm going to shut up soon. Uh, reset number four uh, is, a, is a proper process for land release, a single window for land release transactions. Right now, uh, 
I don't think we really know how much land we actually have in Colombo from the government, or where it is, or who really owns it. There is no proper digital cadaster of who owns it. And if you want to find a piece of land, you don't know who to talk to. And if you find a piece of land and you say, okay, maybe this works, you don't know how to procure it. That has to be unlocked. And that's one of the problems along Beira Lake. It, it, that land belongs to maybe about six or seven agencies. Nobody can really release it. Uh, you need to have a single window process. I won't talk uh, ad nauseum about this, but there's an exceptionally good model in Singapore. They do this routinely that we can easily uh, model after. But again, from an investor perspective, just one point to come in where you can just have an above board, clean, transparent transaction, a predictable transaction, and you have all the information related to the land kind of done. You also need to look at structure of these land transactions. Okay, one of the reasons you have only luxury developments in the city, even on leased land, is because you know, it's like 15 million bucks a perch. You pay it on day one. Your economics are shot the moment you buy the land. You can't invest in middle income housing because you've buried all your cash in the land. You have to look at transaction structures which make middle income housing viable. Okay, and that's something that you really, really need to look at. And of course, there are PPP structures that you can go, out and go after as well, but you have to have the capacity, you have to have a focal point uh, to do this with the intellectual and professional capacity to execute those transactions. Okay, so four resets, as I said. But if you do those four resets, you have a cascading range of positive outcomes a whole bunch of economic uh, outcomes, not least of which is just releasing years of somebody's life to, be, to productive labor, uh, but you know, uh, better housing accessibility, uh, less reliance on fossil fuels. You know, the petrol queues we have are because of our addiction to, uh, to private transport, but it's really because of bad land use and transport. Okay, so you, you cure all these kind of uh, these uh, these kinds of issues and the whole range. I won't I won't get into all of them, uh, but you know the positive outcomes are really quite cascading. So I'll end it with this, and I'll end it positively uh, because I know most of you guys are probably kind of depressed right now after looking at the fast bunch of presentations about how messy we are. You know this thinking is not new. Most of these interventions that we talked about were actually being done, had been initiated, were funded, and under implementation. The LRT obviously is one. The Kalani Valley Rhine was under the Suburban Rail Project, which was funded by ADB. The MCC was looking at the bus modernization and an integrated uh, traffic control system. They were also looking at land cadastralization of the, of the government lands. Right? Uh, candy rail uh, upgrading was actually being studied by the railway department, again funded by ADB. Uh, but these things take time. You know, urban development is a long-term process. Cities evolve. They don't get built overnight. There are no quick fixes. So you have to have a decidedly long-term perspective and just stay at it. You have to have the commitment uh, to stick through reforms and to see these investments through. Right? So to succeed in urban reform, and I think very much it is possible. But to succeed at it, you must have a reform and invest, an investment agenda that stays consistent through political cycles. And if we do that, I'm 100% confident we can get there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marvel Mader. I would now like to invite the rest of the panel. Joining us virtually is Dr. Dimanta De Silva, Senior Lecturer, University of Muratua, along with the moderator, Satya Karunaratna. Over to you, Satya.
Thank you, Anuka, for that introduction. Thank you, Mr. Mavid Mada, for that very comprehensive presentation. Um, I'd like to kick off the panel with a very central point that you touched in your presentation, which is transit-oriented development. And I'd like to pose a question at Mr. Dimantha. Uh, Mr. Dimantha, transit-oriented development seems to be a rather unpopular concept in Sri Lanka for both policymakers and the general public. My question to you is, how do you think Sri Lanka should start thinking about this concept and start demystifying the lack of no-no. Yeah, uh, so I think uh, I would actually start with saying transit-oriented development is not a concept that uh, is is actually is something that not implemented rather than uh, not unpopular. So the key to the requirement of a TOD is that you need to have a quality transport uh, network and also the supporting uh, land use zoning. So without being these two being fulfilled, I don't think you can expect TOT to be successful. Now let's see what are the requirements from transport side. Uh, you know, you are looking at, a, you need to have a quality, reliable, efficient transport system. Otherwise, you know, you won't get the TOD um, happening, right? Um, so we looked at this transit uh, uh, development or mass transit, such as suburban railway, the LRTs, or subways, or even the metros. And that is how we would use the location of the station to for densification, right? Um, what we you saw from the presentation from Nayana is, uh, and, and this is exactly why I like sharing the stage with Nayanan or even sharing the stage uh, the the uh, office with Nayanan because he actually you know gives you all the uh, uh, you know the background information you know you you, you could see that you need to f provide an end to end solution right because uh, you saw from his candy uh, so, uh, you know example you know the attractors are connected the schools officers uh, then the, these hospitals are all are attractors. But what was not connected was the homes or the starting point or the generation. So you need to uh, have a solution from end to end. A person, if you want to uh, you know, use this transport oriented development, we need to have both the origin and the destination connected. And the connection is with this uh, mass transit systems. Okay. Uh, and uh, when you, you talked uh, and, you know, we are talked about, uh, uh, so this requires this network based solution. And we talked about the KV line and you talked about, Nina talked about the LRT. And I, I would say that you can't expect a solution just by one LRT or just by one KV line because, you know, you need to give end to end solution. So LRT and the KV line together would have covered a considerable amount of uh, you know, area uh, through uh, you know, through these buffer areas that Nina talked about. So, uh, like you know, as I as I uh, like you know, it's about about 800 meters that a, pe a person would walk for a high mobility corridor. So usually it is about 400 meters uh, for a normal mode, but for a high mobility uh, corridor which has it is more reliable, people are ready to uh, walk more distance, right? So uh, with the LRT and the KV line together, we could have covered uh, and the stations being close about one kilometer apart, we would have covered a, a whole buffer area along the corridor and also on the other side of that, right? So I think you could have, uh, you know, it's, it's very clear that, uh, you know, you can't uh, solve or fix the land, uh, the land use without uh, uh, you know, transport, fixing the transport. And I think Nayana covered that brilliantly, right? So we, with the KV and LRT or even the, uh, you know, railway modernization, we have a huge opportunity to get this right, okay? And and also we need a push from uh, the, the policies from uh, the land use side or the planning of land use because, and this is basically improving the, having the zoning rules to actually dictate how these buffer areas areas are densified and develop as high 
high uh, development uh, high, high densified development and i think naira can add more uh, on how the zoning rules can actually be uh, supported uh, to uh, for the transfer oriented development Thank you, Mr. Dimanta. I'd like to pose an extension of that same question to you, Mr. Mavi Mada. How do you think Sri Lanka should implement transit-oriented development? Do you think it's a process that should be phased out? Uh, absolutely phased out. Uh, I don't think you can force land use change overnight. As I said, cities evolve. It's a long-term process. You, I think immediately you can do two things. One is you can start to change zoning regulations uh, in certain areas to stimulate this higher density and take out these weird things like one-to-one -one parking uh, uh, that immediately give you, uh, give you a boost. Uh, but then you also need to look at these state plans that are not fragmented uh, and start looking at releasing those next to transit uh, as, a, as a first move. Uh, and then if you, if you do these things of liberalizing the, the regulations a little bit and restricting the fragmentation by uh, requiring larger minimum plot sizes, uh, then the market will basically take care of the rest. You really don't have to mess with it too much, right? Uh, I mean, you, you walk around people, Colombo and people complain, oh, you know, my house is being broken down, they're building a high rise next to it. Unfortunately, that needs to happen. Uh, and you see that happening in Colombo because the economics just make sense. Uh, so if the economics make sense along these transit corridors, that will gradually happen. But the, tra the, the state plans offer an opportunity to, to, to fast track. Uh, and you know, some would say, okay, do you have to invest in transit first and then do it? I would say, you know what? Do Colombo Fort first. You don't even need transit. You can walk to everywhere in Colombo from, from Fort Railway Station. Uh, and you've got 50 acres of land already. Uh, so you have to do it sequentially. Most of this the market can take care of. On the development side, uh, the transit, the force the government will have to do. But you lead with commitment to transit uh, and kind of a psychological shift from I'm going to build more flyovers and do more roads to I'm going to put every spare bit I have into promoting mass transit. You have to make that kind of psychological shift. And then it's really really strategic ones for this high density, and then zone it and let the market care, take care of it. And the market can take care of it, and it takes care of it in many parts of the world. Thank you, Mr. Mavil Mada. I'd like to pivot to this whole idea of land value capture and pose a question to Mr. Dimanta. Uh, Mr. Dimanta, do you think land value capture should be incorporated into infrastructure assessment, and do you think this happens in Sri Lanka? Uh, I think uh, uh, the land value capture is something that we don't really take into consideration in our assessments. So when it comes to a typical economic analysis that we do with, uh, you know, uh, our infrastructure development uh, with the feasibilities, our pre-feasibilities, uh, the typical, uh, you know, where we look at the economic uh, benefits and we look at uh, for a positive uh, benefit cost ratio or EIR are, you know, close to about 10%. Uh, to see whether it's viable. But this benefit calculation looks uh, mainly on, uh, on the travel time saving, travel cost saving, and uh, you know, accident cost saving or environmental benefits, right? So, but we don't capture the benefit that comes out of the project to uh, increase in the land prices, right? So if you could see with the LRT, we saw that we saw the prices going up uh, during different stages, which when we are in, we were having the initial discussions about the LRT, okay, one time it went up, second time, uh, you know, when the agreements were signed, it again went up, then when actually the work started, it went up again. So you could see this this change, the you know land value change is actually uh, you know connected with the, the 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 that project. So the the reason that the other benefits are kind of used is because it's quantifiable through the transport modeling process. But in in the one of the reasons that the land value capture is not considered in is because it's not 
quantified with the current process in Sri Lanka, which is not the case in other countries like, you know, where I'm staying right now in Calgary, uh, you know, every project looks at the benefits to the, you know, the price increase in the land and the benefits come, comes through the, through the land use as well. So I think land value capture has to be considered in and that process, you know, we need to start looking at it because I think we are really underestimating the economic benefits uh, of each project. Thank you, Mr. Dimanta. A very short question to you, Mr. Mabil Mada. How do you think Sri Lanka can recover the costs of our infrastructure investments, in your opinion? Uh, I, I think land value capture is perhaps the key. Um, because in most countries, uh, transit systems are loss-making on a cash basis. Uh, but where you get the value is in this massive connectivity that you get and the, and the huge upswing uh, in, in the livability and the value of the lands around it. So you take Singapore, for example, uh, when they, they of course plan much better than us. So they, when they plan an LR, uh, a, a, a metro line, a few years before they announce anything, they go and acquire one kilometer, I think it was, I can't remember, it was 500 meters square, uh, meter radius, they acquire all the land. Then they build it, and they get huge upside because then they start systematically selling it, selling this land. And it's interesting the way they do it, they don't start by selling the land closest to the host station, they sell it from the outside in because by the time you get to the center, you've got pumping values. Uh, I, I don't think that will work that easily in Sri Lanka because as soon as you announce you're going to acquire uh, land around one kilometer or 500 meters around the station, you're going to politically kill the project. Uh, so there's other ways to do it. You do have uh, a massive upside in land value, that's very clear, uh, but you have, uh, you have ways to recover it through property taxation. Uh, that's one way. Uh, there's also ways to recover it through permitting costs. So if you are, say, for example, uh, 200 meters from a railway station and you want to do a development, you can have a much higher permitting cost for that. So the government recoups uh, part of this. So it's really, in the end, a blend. Uh, and there's, again, many examples around the world. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. They do it very, very well in Singapore. They do it very, very well in Hong Kong. Uh, they do it well in many countries. Uh, so there's no reason we can't do it. And there's plenty of case studies around the world uh, that we can follow. Thank you, Mr. Mabil Mada. I'd like to pivot to state land and private-public partnerships. Uh, Mr. Dimanta, do you think private-public partnerships are proven to be rather difficult in Sri Lanka? And what role do you think state land plays in this? Yeah, I think uh, the, what we have seen from past studies, uh, recent studies, that the PPP or the private-public partnership has, is difficult. And this is mainly because, uh, uh, like, you know, in in Sri Lankan context, it's uh, even though it's, it's economically feasible, uh, it, the financially feasible is is long term. So it takes forty to fifty years to kind of recover the the, the monetary cost. And uh, you know when you look it from uh, from a financial investor who's come who, who comes to invest a project, they would not wait until 40 50 years to get that return of investment so they are, they would be looking at about 20 to 25 years and this is mainly happening because our ticket price is so low now when you consider that the, you know the ticket price is low and we we because we have actually priced the ticket at for low income group right and this is partly because our we have a flaw in our taxation system where we are not able to uh, actually capture or identify uh, the tax bracket tax like you know the income levels of each person so we can actually uh, price the tickets uh, in a in a better way so i think you know that can partly solve the problem but also what we have to identify is like you know because of this what we call the gap right we see that there is a gap for an investor uh, and uh, we, the government has to provide gap financing. And what we have seen from uh, the railway projects or the LRT uh, uh, project that was for the red line that was looked at, we need about 40 to 45 percent of the, uh, the project cost to be provided as gap financing by the government. And this has to be provided either by funds, money, or it can be through land, 
right? So uh, the, now this is where the state land can, can come in, but you, all, you also have to keep in mind the, the, the whether we have enough land to do that as well. And to so just to give you the numbers, like, you know, for example, uh, the one golf face land area was about 10 acres and actually it was, uh, I think, about 125 million US dollars at that time. So this is heart in the Kalam, heart in Colombo. So when you are looking at about a project like the the red line, the PPPLRT that was looked at, we are we were looking at about a, uh, I think a two billion dollar uh, cost because it was a, a longer distance, about twenty four kilometers. But that that makes it's about you know less than one billion to be uh, you know required through uh, through as as gap financing. So we need to understand okay how, how much of land that we can provide as well now as nina kind of rightly said i think our prime land is this fort area the fort multimodal hub that was actually planned and the air right is what we had to have to have to use uh, to kind of identify how we can actually uh, you know use this state land and with a purpose, as he said, because it's important that we don't allow unnecessary development. We want the development according to a plan where we what we want to, uh, you know, develop and that development to support the, the transport infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Dimanta. Mr. Nayana, in your presentation, you touched on a single window for land clearance and land transactions. And even under the MCC, I think we missed out on a digital inventory for all available land. Um, could you talk to us about why this becomes so important to Sri Lanka, given the context we're in at the moment? Uh, sure. Can I quickly respond to Dimanta? Yeah. Because I disagree with Dimanta uh, that PPPs are, PPPs are not possible. I think PPPs are possible. The problem we have to do a PPP right now is nobody trusts us, uh, so we need to kind of get out of this rut we're in. The rest of it is about structure, right? So yes, you have on one side, uh, you have um, huge land cap value capture opportunities, uh, and a lot of these can get structured uh, on, on kind of an availability payment or availability guarantee structure. Uh, a lot of times you have uh, PPPs done where the land is given to the developer, which is a bit of an inefficient way to do it because then the developer or the, the whoever is trying to do it starts thinking too much about the real estate, too little about uh, the, the transit. Uh, so ideally, if we have it together, you do these two separately and you, and you kind of merge this uh, at, the, at the center. So I, I think PPPs are clearly possible. There's a bit of complication in, in structuring it, but you know we've got folks out here that have done these kinds of PPPs before. It's not as bad as Sri Lankan Airlines, so I think we can we can pull it off. Yeah. Um, sorry, your other question was something else. <laughs> I, got the uh, I was talking about a single window for land clearance and land transactions. Yeah, and yeah, just... yeah. So I think I think single window for land transactions. Again, I think it's a critical step. It's something that we can do relatively quickly, uh, and I think there are lots of global models to follow. So again, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. Just go to Singapore, look at what they do. They have a brilliantly transparent process where you know all the state lands that they plan to uh, release for the next five, 10 years is in a catalog. I mean, I can walk into uh, URA and get it, and you know what's coming out next year and what the process is. It's, it, it, it's not that complicated. Thank you, Mr. Mabil Mada. Before we move on to the last round of questions, given the time constraints, I'd like to open the audience, uh, open the floor for questions. If there are any questions, do indicate, and we will provide you with a microphone. Any questions at all? There is one question. Can okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Marvel Mother, for your presentation. I also work in real estate development and apartment development, and this is a topic really near and dear to me. The thing I wanted to ask about was. You said earlier uh, there's a lot of local tension when you develop an apartment building, some of the neighbors dislike it, all that. But what I was wondering was what can a developer do to, when they're going into a new area, they're looking at a project, what can they do to get more local support for it, to maybe educate against all of that contention? Uh, 
I think there's no silver bullet answer. It depends on the community and depends on who you're dealing with. But I think uh, it helps if the, if the policy environment and the narrative around housing is much more around multifamily housing. It, it, it's not seen, you know, you have a conversation uh, about housing and any time you talk about, uh, you know, high density housing, people start saying, oh, I don't want to live in a concrete jungle. But as I showed in my presentation, you know, the, the concrete jungle is what we live in now. We've carved up the Western province into 10 perch plots and taken out most of the trees, taken out most of the wetlands. That's the concrete jungle. Once you concentrate it, uh, you open up a huge amount of space for open space and green space. And I, uh, so you will, you will inevitably have this conflict uh, as, as this transition happens. And this is a conflict, again, that is not unique to Sri Lanka. It happens in every city. Uh, and this is inevitable. Uh, so your government needs to help through that transition. Uh, and you will have some growth pains, but you know, it's, you have to just do it. I'd like to go to Mr. Dimanta. I think even when we spoke in preparation uh, for this discussion, um, you, you said you've thought a lot about a broader approach to solve Sri Lanka's transportation problem. Could you walk us through your thought process? Uh, so I think we we talk a lot about uh, public transport needed, right? It, it's it's true. We need public transport, but you know you, t you need to think wherever. Like we are around, uh, we are having about fifty two percent with public transport right now, but it's declining, right? So, but still, even with a very efficient public transport, we will going to about sixty seventy percent. Maybe it would be great to have it about seventy percent. So still, the thirty percent has to be provided by you know, private vehicles. Now, this is where we need to kind of have a balance, right? No, so that is where we need to identify the mobility is not only by one mode. Like, you know, we, we need to provide a broad concept is we, we need to provide mobility through all the modes, right? You know, by car or by taxi or by bicycle, by bus, by LRT, by railway. You know, you need to have that mobility and the option should be allowed to the user. We can't force a person to use it. Don't put you in the shoe and think about it because a, let's say a, a senior person who is who cannot actually walk, uh, he has difficulties in walking. His best mode of transport is not public transport. His best mode of transport is private transport, right? So uh, maybe during the time, right? For example, late in the night, providing a mass transport is not efficient. So a best mode of transport late in the night or early in the morning uh, for a doctor who's going for appointment for, uh, for his consultation or to look at his uh, patients is, is his private vehicle, right? But so this is where you need to provide accessibility like you know all the mode access to the people but then we make the public transport which we all know as the most efficient transport as the uh, as the most uh, you know attractive one we make it faster we make make it better connected we provide it at a lower cost uh, than the private vehicles and then we make it attractive and then we make we make that attractive mode, but also we make the push towards the, the public transport by the policies, uh, such as that what Naina spoke about, uh, you know, uh, about, you know, congestion pricing, uh, higher parking fees. For example, the Calgary uh, now, where I live right now, has the third highest parking fees. So people are encouraged to use the public transport. Right. And also other things like, you know, government incentives for people to use public transport, such as, you know, giving a free monthly pass in, in instead of the full allowances. So we make push towards the public transport, but we can't do that without the high quality public transport. So we, let's need to get the public transport. But that option of choosing which mode has to be provided, given to the user. And now when you talk about the public transport, the, the what we have found today with the fuel issue and with people you know moving into uh, the trying to get into public transport for a reason actually not because of uh, you know having a better quality public transport but they have found that that we don't have capacity and this is what we you know this is what which has been debated a lot the bus service that is there is not able to carry the passengers 
if the or people from private vehicles uh, you know come into the public transport so that is why we need our rail system to be the main mode of transport coming into the city and whenever we can't have railway development we can go with the lrt in the corridors that you know uh, you know can, can be developed right and then the the bus actually has to change into uh, the change its role and it change its role into more feeder system and we have uh, it, it actually provide connecting get into the housing getting to the neighborhoods collect the people and get into the railways and the lrts so that people can be brought into the city in a much faster and much efficient way and this is the this is this broader concept uh, has to be brought in and if we can do that actually we will successfully uh, transform our transportation system right uh, one more thing before i stop I think I want to clarify what I said. Uh, what uh, you know, Naina said. Uh, I think I want to clarify. I didn't. I didn't. Dis I didn't uh, say that we can't do with PPP. What I said, it's difficult to do with PPP. I didn't go into the details of why it was not. What is difficult? It was mainly because you know the the PPP project that the LRT was looking at was actually expanded. You know, the railway lines was expanded beyond the. Uh, uh, urban areas making is not viable actually if you actually make it more compressed it will be actually more more feasible as a ppp model right thank you mr dimanta due to time constraints i think we've come to the conclusion of this panel discussion thank you mr dimanta and thank you mr naina for joining in with us thank you everybody for your attention thank you